Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. So one of the most popular questions and, and comments I get here on YouTube is about roofing screws. And, uh, you know, I'm not the brightest person around, but when I respond to the same types of questions and comments a few million times, suddenly it dawns on me, hey, this might be a good topic for a video. So that's what we're going to talk about today, uh, roofing screws on a metal roof. And you might think that a roofing screw is a really teeny part of what goes into a metal roof. Um, but it turns out it's a key part. It's a very important part. So when you spec out a roof, when you plan a job, when you install the roof, uh, it turns out that the screws are one of the most uh, critical parts of, of that job. So it it's really is a good topic to go into um, uh, with the video. And I, I, today I want to kind of get into the uh, where, how, and, and why you know you put screws into a metal roof uh, the way the way we do. Um, and we're going to start by looking at some installation data from different roofing manufacturers to see where they want us to put uh, screws on a metal roof. Talk about why that's the case. You know, we have to worry about things like uplift resistance when there's wind and just retention of fasteners into the type of framing you use on your roof. Um, and then we'll talk about how you should put the screws in, both the kinds of tools you can use, and then also how to drive the screws in to get really the best performance out of the uh, sealing gasket uh, on these exposed fastener types of, of metal roofs. Um, and then finally at the end I'm going to give you a tip that I think can make uh, installing a metal roof uh, quite a bit easier and uh, you know hopefully make your, your job go uh, a lot smoother. So stick around and we will get started. All right, so here we are at the computer, and what I want to do first is step through some of the installation guides and, and basically installation data that you can get from a roofing manufacturer to kind of discuss where you're supposed to put screws on a metal roof. Now, I, I think there's kind of a big debate, uh, at least I would say that based on some of the comments I get on my channel, as to whether you should put screws on the peaks of the metal roof or down in the valleys. And people have really strong opinions about this. Um, you know, my, my feeling is, well, you know, do what you want to do. Uh, there really is no universally perfect way to do this. There's really not one way that's better than the other. If you feel strongly about one way, you know, do it that way. If you want, really want your screws to be up on the peaks, on the ribs, you know, put them there. Um, but I think really the best thing you can do and really the best way to make a decision on this is to look at the manufacturer's installation data, what they want you to do. Um, and just follow that because their information is going to be based on a few things. I mean, they do the calculations, they do the engineering, uh, they think about things like uplift resistance, retention of fasteners, uh, against wind loads, um, you know, uh, retention of panels on the roof underneath snow loads. They think about all that stuff that you might not necessarily think about. You might not have the expertise to think about that. You might not even know about stuff like that. And so, you know, I think in terms of engineering and specs and recommendations, you really want to go with what the panel manufacturer tells you to do, just because they're the ones that know, you know, the most about their roofing panels, how they're supposed to be used, um, and what they're selling to you and what they want you to do with these products. So, uh, you know, that's my, my suggestion. Don't get caught in any debates. Look at what the manufacturer wants you to do. And the kind of the other thing uh, related to that, and really the upshot of this is if you ever get into a situation where you need to um, take advantage of the warranty on the roof, uh, I can tell you from experience, you're going to have a much better chance of getting warranty coverage if you have installed the roof according to to the specifications and guidelines given by the manufacturer. Now, in, in my whole 30, 40 year career doing this stuff, I haven't ever heard of a metal roof with problems, but I've had a lot, heard of a lot of issues with asphalt roofs and I've experienced some on jobs where we had to seek uh, warranty coverage. And the, those companies, they just love to get out of a warranty issue by finding some Thing, uh, some flaw, some something you did wrong when you install the roof, either with the fasteners or the flashing or the angle of the roof that's put on or the exposure. You know, if they can find something you did wrong that lets them get out of their warranty, uh, they will. So, just in general, you know, my experience with with roofing, um, if you care about the warranty on the product, follow the manufacturer guidelines as far as installation. So. I just wanted to step through some of the different guidelines I've seen online. Um, here's one for PBR panel, and I, I'm just going to pick some typical panel types I've used. I like 
PBR panel that stands for Perlin Bearing Rib uh, because you can walk on this roof. It's, it's very rigid, it's very stiff. Typically, this is a 26 gauge panel. It's got very uh, tall ribs uh, and that gives it a lot of strength. And so I like this panel for, for any type of job where I know we need to walk on the roof, either during installation or after installation. Uh, one good example is um, this is what I choose if I'm going to put a roof on a boathouse because we don't really have the luxury of putting up ladders, putting up a lot of scaffolding and staging. Um, when you're working over a dock or over a pier or around water, you know, if you need to walk on a roof, you don't want to be fiddling around and worrying about denting the roof. You want a roofing panel that can support your weight. And so I like PBR panel for, for boathouse roofs. Uh, it's just a stiffer panel. And so here's an example from MBCI, uh, the fastener locations they recommend for PBR panel. And you can see they have the screws down in the valleys, uh, one adjacent to um, each rib. Uh, the screw over here is going to uh, uh, really hold down this overlap uh, section of the panel and uh, in turn retain uh, the underlap section of, of the previous panel. Okay, so that screw is going to really hold down that joint just fine. Uh, and you should also be using butyl tape um, at this joint. Uh, by the way, um, one of the things with the PBR, the pearl and bearing rib, is they have an extra large... Uh, section under the ends of the panels so that can bear down as a port weight when it rests on the purlins. Um, but here's an example, you know, MBCI, they, they want you to put the screws down in the valleys. Here's the interior panel screw locations at the ends of the panels and that would be at the eave or if panels overlap, they have an extra screw specified uh, in each valley uh, for more retention. Um, and then we can look at um, ABC Metal Roofing. This is a company I tend to buy a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of panels from. And uh, again, they show a bunch of different panel types here, PBR, PBU, PBC, um, you know, all the way on down. And again, they're showing the fasteners down in the valleys. Um, and uh, here they, they have one diagram for the interior of the panel. And if we scroll up uh, panel ends, again, they specify an additional fastener down in the valleys. Um, here. And then there's one other one I wanted to look at. Uh, let's see, I think it's that one. Yeah, this is McElroy uh, Metal Roofing. And here they've got uh, screw patterns for a bunch of different panels. Max Rib, Mini Rib, R Panel, which is the same as PBR. Uh, 5V Crimp. I use a lot of that on farm structures. That's, that's, that's nice roofing. And you can see again, they're telling you, you know, they want their screws uh, in the valleys. Um, and then an additional screw at the ends of the panels or where the panels overlap. One additional feature they show here is a stitch fastener um, on the rib of some of these panel types to really uh, close that, that uh, seam or that joint down well. And they, they also specify butyl tape sealant there. Um, so that's an important detail. That's a little, something a little bit different that they are asking for that ABC didn't in their specifications. And uh, uh, typically these other fasteners would be appropriate, uh, chosen to be appropriate for whatever you're screwing the roofing down to. So, you know, if you're going down into wood purlins or metal purlins, you'd have a screw for that. But the stitch fasteners, they are almost always a self-tapping screw uh, because at this point you really only want to join the panels to each other. You, you don't need to go down into the framing for that. So stitch fasteners are almost always self-tappers. And again, with that butyl tape in there. So those are some guidelines from uh, three different roofing companies. Um, and they're pretty much, uh, you know, all asking uh, for you to put your screws down in the valleys, not on the peaks, not on the ribs. Um, so one of the things I wanted to do is um, show you what the pattern ends up looking like. And this is a roof I put up, I guess, about a year and a half ago. And I did some videos on this. This was my timber frame carport and this uh, is imperial rib panel from abc metal roofing this is a 29 gauge panel um, for this application on land i wasn't worried about uh, heavy winds i wasn't worried about walking on the roof so i i went with a lighter uh, 29 gauge panel and um, I, I like this pattern and so if you look at their installation data where they recommend the screws to be what i've done here is i've highlighted one panel 
in green and then in purple showing all the fastener locations uh, that you can see. And so, you know, on the interior of the panel, again, we have a fastener basically in the valley next to each rib. This is our overlap side. So this fastener is gonna retain the underlap side of the previous panel. Um, and then if we go to the next panel, it's overlap side is gonna retain the underlap side of this green panel. So we've got screws uh, adjacent to the rib, but down in the valley um, along each rib. And then at the end of the panel, there's an additional screw placed in the valley uh, just because you need more retention there. Uh, and then up at the peak, up at the ridge, that changes a little bit because we have to think ahead about coming in later on and installing a ridge cap on this panel. And so you need to think ahead, well, how am I going to install that ridge cap? Um, you're probably going to tend to either have a foam closure strip um, between the panel and the ridge cap or may maybe a foam vent just to keep um, insects and dust out. But either way, there's going to be some sort of uh, foam um, uh, a ceiling strip that's placed in there between the, the panel and, and the ridge cap. And then you need to fasten the ridge cap down. Um, there are cases where you, the, you, you fasten the, the ridge cap down through the panel with the same types of screws you've used for the rest of the panel, just longer. You go through the ribs for that down into the framing. Uh, there are other cases where you'd have, you know, uh, standard screws along the, the, the valleys of the panel up here. Then you'd put additional screws with self-tappers through the ridge cap down into the panels. And so there's different ways to do that depending on the type of ridge cap you use. And generally the manufacturer is going to have recommendations for that too. So uh, it could be a little bit different um, up at the ridge. Just keep that in mind. But this is the general screw pattern, you know, that's recommended by ABC Metal Roofing for these, these panel types. Um, and again, they want the screws down in the valleys. Uh, I've done that for years. I've never had any issues. And I like to follow the guidelines of the manufacturer just because they know what they're doing when they specify this stuff. And if there's ever a warranty issue, they're the ones who are going to have to, you know, be happy with, with how I install the panel before they give me uh, warranty coverage. Now, in terms of why you want fasteners in these locations, why you maybe want extras along the eaves, maybe why you might want to do it differently along the ridge. Well, that usually has to do with a couple things. One could be the ability for the panel to stay on the roof, attached to the roof under a snow load that um, otherwise would want to tear that panel off the roof and slide it down. Uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind. The other one is going to be uh, winds. And this is where things get real interesting. Um, and what I'm showing here is a computational fluid dynamic simulation of hurricane force winds over a roof. In this case, the winds are coming from the left side of the screen, so they're blowing over the roof in this direction. And what we're looking at here are color contours of uplift pressure in pounds per square foot on that roof. And so what happens with a roof, any type of roof, uh, when the wind blows over it, um, it's almost like blowing over the top of an airplane wing. You end up getting low pressure on the upper surface of the roof. Um, the lower surface of the roof, you know, the wind's not down there. It could be the interior of a building. That tends to be more of a standard atmospheric pressure. So you end up getting high pressure below the roof, low pressure above the roof, and that causes uplift. And that's what wants to tear the roof off when you get winds and hurricanes and tornadoes. Um, well, what we can see here, there's a you know, pretty even distribution of, you know, five to 10 PSF of, of uplift over much of the roof. But there are these peaky areas where we have much, much higher uplift. You, you have it right here near the peak on, on the gable and then uh, uh, along the ridge over here. In those areas, we can get as much as 75 uh, up to 110 PSF of uplift that wants to peel that roof off. And so um, and then, you know, down here, we've got a, a different dynamic at this, as this, uh, Eve line where the wind's coming in, um, uh, that, that happens to be a downforce that's going to push the roof down. That's not going to want to peel it off, but you get these strange dynamics along the roof in different locations. And what that means is that, well, you know, depending on the wind, depending on the wind direction, depending on your roof orientation, you might have to deal with much, much higher loads, 
on, on roofs in certain locations. And so in this case, I'm looking at this and thinking, well, this is obvious. I'm going to, I would want more screws along, um, you know, my, uh, my gable ends, um, because of this, this high uplift is very peaky here. The roof might be fine over here, but there's going to be a much stronger uplift here. That's going to want to peel that panel off. Once it gets started, it's going to kind of come off like a can opener and peel the rest of it off. So these are reasons you might have different screw patterns in different places, depending on all kinds of considerations with storms, hurricanes, wind loads, uplift, um, and things like that. And so uh, one of the most recent jobs I did was a boathouse roof over a pier. And um, uh, we took into account what would happen under wind loads uh, on that kind of roof. And when you think about uplift loads, it's not just the fasteners holding the metal down to the roof. You got to think, okay, well, I got those fasteners holding the metal panel to the purlins. Well, the purlins, I need to keep those attached to the rafters. Well, I need to keep the rafters attached to the beams. And then I need to keep the beams attached to the posts or, or the pilings, you know, whatever might be holding it down. And you really need to think these wind loads through uh, from the roof all the way on down to all the different fasteners and components in the roof framing. And so um, because of these considerations on that pier roof, we had an extra row of purlins uh, on near the gable ends of the roof so that we could put more roofing screws through the metal into the framing. And then there were more screws uh, from the purlins into the rafters and so on. And so that's the kind of thing you want to keep in mind when you're doing this. There's a reason people have uh, different screw patterns specified. There's a reason they might want more fasteners on the ends of the panels. They might want stitch fasteners on the overlaps. And, and you know, you, you can kind of trust the roofing companies to know this stuff. And, and it's another reason um, why I like to follow their guidelines. Okay, so here we're looking at uh, really the most common types of roofing screws you're going to be using on a project where you're screwing down roofing panels to uh, wood or, or metal purlins um, on a roof, which would be typical for a pole barn. Um, and there's lots of variations on these types of screws, but uh, really the common theme to all of these is that they've got some sort of a washer with a rubber gasket underneath. Uh, there's different washer shapes. There's some that have a cap shape. Some integrate the cap and the washer into the screw. But really the, the common theme to all of these is that you're going to have some sort of a, a rubber sealing gasket underneath a, a washer, uh, which is what is going to seal up the hole, the screw hole, and you know keep water out of that roof, keep it watertight and uh, airtight over the years. Now, um, <clears throat> these are typical screws you'd be using to go into wood purlins, and uh, there's different lengths. Uh, you're gonna probably want a longer screw if you're screwing through the ribs, or if you're uh, screwing the tops of your panels in with a, a piece of ridge trim where you do go through the ribs. And if you wanna catch a purlin, you're gonna wanna go with a longer screw. And then these last two here on the right, those are actually hot dipped galvanized uh, roofing screws. And it's very important to use that type of screw if you're screwing into pressure treated lumber um, because that type of lumber is just gonna eat up uh, these standard uh, plated screws. Uh, I mean, within you know four or five years, these guys will be uh, rusted away to nothing. So definitely if you're using pressure treated lumber, um, order those hot dip galvanized screws. And then over here in the far left, we have a self-tapping screw. Um, these are sometimes called stitch screws. These are really intended to attach the metal panels um, or metal trim to another piece of metal. Could be another panel uh, or a trim piece to a panel where you really want only want to connect uh, the metal panels and not go down into a purlin. Uh, these could be typically used uh, down the rib uh, when you want to stitch two panels together at, at their joint, at their seam, uh, or when you're attaching different types of trim uh, to the panels. There are some cases where you do not, you specifically do not want your screws to go all the way through down into the wood framing. You really just want metal to metal um, uh, fastening, and, and those are the cases where you're going to want to use a self-tapping screw. Now there's a whole other range of different screw types used for trim um, on, on metal roofing. Um, and there's some with a pan head, there's some with what we call a pancake head that's very, very flat. Um, those are generally gonna be 
uh, screws that are painted to match the roof color uh, that, that do not have a washer and gasket. They're strictly for locations and, and uh, situations where you're attaching trim pieces to, say, a, a fascia board or uh, a rake or something, and you don't need the ceiling. Uh, but you might want something that looks a little bit neater for, for better presentation uh, for trim work. So that's a quick overview of screws. Um, generally, all the projects I've done, I've only, you know, ever used uh, these different types of screws, either standard screws in different lengths or the hot dip galvanized in different lengths, and then some self-tappers uh, for the, uh, you know, the oddball outlier situations where you're going uh, to fasten panel to panel. Okay, so now we can talk about how to put your screws in, and you would think this is the easy part, but this is where a lot of people go wrong. And, you know, you might have thousands or tens of thousands of these screws over the install of a metal roof. And uh, if you do this part wrong, uh, it's going to come back to bite you years later and you're, you're really going to be unhappy. So this is one of those little details that can really affect your roof on a large scale and, and uh, really be a factor down the road. And so I've got three different uh, examples of screws that have been driven in here. On the left, we have a screw that has been underdriven, and uh, this one, the, the washer is not tight, the rubber gasket is not making good contact with the roof. That one's going to leak. Uh, that's no good. In the middle here, we've got a screw that's been overdriven, and I think this is probably the most common mistake I see. Um, it's certainly the most common failure. I've I've uh, gone in and fixed old roofs, uh, you know, five, ten years after they were put in, that were leaking at the screws. And they're leaking because the the screw was overdriven, which which is kind of counter to intuition. Um, and in fact, I think a lot of people, you know, their thought is, well, I'm going to get this thing down nice and snug and and seal it up really good. Um, and that's good initially, but when you overdrive the screw and you squish out that gasket like that, what that does is it exposes the uh, rubber gasket to the elements, to sunlight, to to water, uh, to you know dust, contaminants, you name it. Just really ex exposes it all around the edge to the environment, and that significantly increases the rate at which it's going to deteriorate and degrade over time. And so, uh, I tell you what, I'd say nine out of ten times when uh, when I've had to go fix somebody's roof where they have a leak around a screw, it's because the screw was overdriven. And the gasket failed and that can fail within years it doesn't take long um, uh, just because you just squish that thing out too much and uh, it just uh, it really accelerates uh, 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 degradation over time uh, when you do that and finally over here on the right we have a screw that i would call just right and uh, this one the, the the gasket and the washer are making good contact with the metal uh, it's tight, but the gasket is still entirely underneath uh, the surface of that washer. It's really wearing that washer kind of like a hat, and that's what you want to see. And uh, this one's hard to describe. It, it's hard to show on video. I tried to capture this on video, but if you practice putting in screws, my suggestion is get up close, watch that little rubber gasket as you're driving the screw in, and you'll see there's a point where as you tighten it down, that little gasket is going to kind of plump and just ever so gently bulge a little bit as the, the washer starts to press it down. And that is where you want to stop. Okay, you, you want to ensure that you've made contact, that the rubber gasket is in good contact with the roof, um, but that you're not going to the point where you're starting to flatten it and squish it out and, and overdrive it. And so it'll take some practice uh, to, to get to that, but you'll know it when you see it. It's just, it's, it's obvious that, hey, this is just right. You just kind of plump that thing out a little bit. That's your visual clue that you've made good contact um, and you're sealing up the hole and that's where you want to stop. You need to resist the urge to go any further because this is the point where things are just right and uh, the gasket is going to do what you want it to do. So those are the three common cases, underdriven, overdriven, just right. This is the most common one I see and also the most common failure. 
Okay, so now we can talk about the type of tools you wanna to use to put roofing screws in. And there's actually a lot of flexibility here. Um, there's, there's many different types of drivers that are gonna work well for you. In the old days, I used this type of uh, dedicated screw gun that actually has a dog clutch on the front here. This is different than a slip clutch that you'll find on most modern uh, cordless drills uh, that let go at a certain torque. Uh, this dog clutch actually would allow you to engage and disengage uh, the bit just by pushing down on the nose of the gun. When you engage that clutch, it connects the bit to the motor and the gearing and you drive the screw. And then as soon as you lift and take pressure off of the nose, it would disengage. And that made it very easy to say, whoa, to know when to stop, you just you know lift the gun off. Uh, you didn't have to worry about taking your finger off the trigger fast enough. Um, in fact, you could you could lock this trigger in and leave the gun running and just keep grabbing screws and zip them in. And there were actually variations of this gun that had a depth gauge on the front um, that really were no brainer to use. I mean, between the clutch and the depth gauge, you just keep pushing screws in. They'd go in just the right amount and you go to the next screw. Um, you'll commonly still see these in use today uh, for drywall. Um, and so this is still around, um, but um, for me at least, it's not really uh, my favorite for roofing anymore. What I've, what I've moved to nowadays is a cordless impact driver. And normally you'll use an impact driver when you're putting in uh, deck screws, framing screws, situations where you need high torque and you need to maybe push a long screw into some wood and, and you get the benefit out of the impact. Normally with a roofing screw, there's not a lot of resistance. So we're not using this for the high torque or for the impact. Really the benefit to me is the amount of control you get. Uh, because uh, as the screw draws down into the metal and uh, starts to snug up, this gun is automatically going to slow down and, and increase torque. And that really gives you um, kind of a ramp of, of control. You know, it, it's slowing down just as you need to ease up uh, so that you don't overdrive the screw. So I really like these for fine control. And again, we're not doing it for torque. We're not doing it for power. It's really for fine control. And um, uh, what I found is, you know, I'll do a few practice uh, screws where I might be looking really close uh, to, to get an idea of what it looks like and feels like when they, that washer and gasket snug up and the washer is compressed the just right amount. Um, but after that, it's very easy to get a feel for how the gun's gonna behave in that situation. And I find that this gives me quite a bit of control. Now you can also use, you know, pretty much any cordless drill a cordless screw gun. I will caution you against trying to use the slip clutch on a modern cordless drill or screw gun because those slip clutches are not consistent. Uh, you know, wood is not consistent. So you're going to find that uh, what works for a clutch setting for one screw is going to be not enough or overkill for the next screw. And you'll just spend all your time messing around with that clutch. So I would skip the clutch uh, if you have one and just really use your eyes and um, you know your, your, your feel to, to understand when the screw and, and washer and gasket are uh, down snug to the right amount. All right, one last piece of advice I wanna give uh, when it comes to screws is to consider pre-drilling holes in your panels where your screws are gonna go down. And this actually has a lot of benefits. I think the biggest benefit is that you always know where the screw is supposed to go you don't have to hunt around and measure while you're up on the roof to figure out where your purlins are or do it by feel. When you pre-drill your holes and you've got a pre-drilled hole pattern, uh, you automatically know where the screws have to go. And then the other thing is it really helps you get the screw started and going easier. So if you're working on a steep roof, if you're working on a difficult section of roof where access is poor or maybe it's uh, just challenging to get up there and stay put safely, Having pre-drilled holes really, really helps. You can go right to where the screw needs to be, put the screw in, it's gonna get started immediately, and uh, you can get that screw zipped down with much, much less fuss than, than uh, if you were trying to you know, find the purl in, get the drill angled right, get everything straight, and then push hard to get the screw started. So I'm a big fan of pre-drilling holes. Really the main thing is that you have to be careful and you know get the holes in the right place. Uh, you don't want to flip the panel up there with you know 12 holes in it and then realize you, you, you're off and you've just put a bunch of holes in your, your roofing panel that are not going to uh, be in the right place. So 
you need to measure carefully. You need to plan this out. Um, but when done right, this is a really, really good uh, tip. It really improves things um, quite a bit. Now, one thing I want to mention, if you do this, um, you're going to want to pack a drill bits. I like to use eighth inch drill bits. I found uh, Irwin drill bits um, really work the best. They last the longest. Uh, they don't they don't give me issues. You will break bits though. Um, so just plan on having a pack of bits around when you do this. And then the other real beneficial thing is to, um, you know, make your measurements, know where your purlins are, know where your screws have to be in relation to the panel edges and ribs and drill one panel, put it up there, make sure it's a good fit. Use that as your template, um, to mark off holes on other panels. And then also you can drill multiple panels at once. You can stack together three to five panels, uh, with the prop proper marks spec'd out for your drill holes and drill that entire stack at once and really turn this into a quick job. All right, so that's going to wrap things up for today. Some of the key takeaways I'm going to leave you with are, first of all, consult your manufacturer's data from the roofing company in terms of where to place your screws, how many screws are needed, and how it relates to wind loads and uplift and, and fastener retention, because that's all very important to consider. Um, you know, you can get advice from people who they might tell you, put your screws on the on the peaks, put, put your screws in the valleys, but really what matters is uh, the manufacturer's recommendation and how it's going to be implemented for your roof in your area with your needs and your wind load. So definitely check into that and, you know, take all that into account. Um, second, when you put your screws in, don't overdrive them. Don't smash the, the gasket. Um, just practice a couple times and you'll get a feel where you can get that screw down just right. So you just begin to plump that gasket so that it seals and stays contained uh, underneath the washer to be protected. It'll last a lot longer. Um, you'll, you'll have few, much, much fewer problems with leaks when you do that. And then finally, you know, consider pre-drilling your panels. If you can work out uh, the pattern and, and pre-drill your, your, your panels in a stack, um, it's gonna make life much, much easier when you get up on the roof. Uh, you won't have to figure out where the purlins are. You won't have to fight starting uh, screws. Uh, it really makes things a whole lot easier. Uh, but again, plan that carefully, you know, and, and also realize your, your start panel and your end panel might have different hole patterns than your middle panels. Uh, be sure to take that into account. So uh, that's going to do it for today. Um, as always, you know, if you have questions or comments, please leave them below. Um, I'm, I'm glad to, to see that stuff and, and try and respond. Um, and also it helps inform me, you know, what kind of videos I should be doing in the future. So thanks for watching.